Welcome back to the Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast with Benji Nice. And this is the Astana Premier Tech 2021 preview. The structure of this is going to be as follows. Review their 2020 season. Look at their transfers in and out this season. We'll pick their teams that we choose for the monuments and the grand tours. And then I think maybe we'll discuss what we think would be a good and bad season for Astana in 2021. But most importantly, we've got an interview with the managing director of Astana Proteins holding company, Yana Seal. We had a chat yesterday about the structure of cycling, some of the things she's implemented at Astana, marketing in cycling, etc. Quite an interesting interview. So we'll timestamp that for you at the end as well. Uh, Make sure you stay tuned for that interview with Yana Seal. But on to Astana Benji. They've brought in Premier Tech as a title sponsor. I think Astana, uh, if, if people don't know, are the sort of Kazakh, it's like a state-sponsored team in a way, has been for 15 years. Premier Tech is a Canadian company that have come in, I think, injecting more money into the team. But what did you think about their 2020 season? 15 wins, was it an uh, overperformance? They overperform? Was it underperformance or about par? For me, it feels a bit on par in the sense that they started out the season of 2020 pretty great with the likes of Full Sang taking home Andalusia. In a, well, he was extremely strong there. I uh, recall him being strong in a lot of the earlier races in the season, and then obviously COVID happened. And after COVID happened, well, they started off strong in the Italian Classics. So the likes of Tritico Lombardo, we've got Lombardia, of course, won by uh, Full Sang himself. And who was also strong there? Vlasov, who ended up winning the move on to the Nivelle Challenge. Giro della Emilia was one. And then Marco Pantani. So all the Italian classics were really good in just follow-up of each other for Astana. And I think that's the strongest moment of the year for them, those Italian classics. Obviously, the highlight is in Lombardia. They ended up going to the Grand Tours. They ended up sending Vlasov to La Vuelta and, well, first to the Giro, but that didn't take too long. And then to uh, La Vuelta. Full Sang was Giro leader on paper because, well, Lopez and the other man, Vlasov, were taken out early when it comes to uh, crashing and illnesses. And in the Giro, Full Sang ended up coming sixth, which is honestly not too bad. I think a lot of people expected more, but I think a lot of people had I think he a expected bit too more. many expectations. Yeah, I think Don't he expected think? more indeed. Yeah. No, at least in the interviews he did for that Danish. Uh, newspaper that or was so good is that or something yeah that was a <laughs> special one to read um in those articles it showed that he was frustrated kind of on his team members throughout the Giro about not doing what they're supposed to do for him and not bringing him to the spots he needed to be in but he also had some bad luck i think he had like two punctures in the Giro although that um that probably didn't change too much regarding his gc spot he would probably just be two minutes closer, but still on six. So in the end, sixth in GC behind Bilbao, Almeida and such. Uh, I think before the Giro started, he would have been like, oh, those five riders, I should be above them at the end of the Giro. He was third favorite. After- when, Thomas, when Thomas went out yeah. and then Yates went out, I think he was like joint favorite with Nibali at like yeah. given 25, 30% chance. This is like four stages in. So you got to remember, everyone's got to remember how strong Full Sang was in stage races, in one-week stage races in 2019. And I mean, I've spoken to a few people. I remember, if you all remember the interview with Jack Haig when I said, hey, what is there some special thing between one week and three week that you can see in power data, etc.? And he was like, no, not really. It's a lot of luck and, and other things and opportunities mostly. So with with uh, Full Sang looking so good, I think yeah he would have expected a podium at the Giro given the uh, the field and and Thomas and Yates being out. So I think I think afterwards he also said that's it. Uh, correct? Did did he Benji? Did he say? Did Full Sang say he's not going for GC and Grand Tours anymore? I recall articles surrounding that, but I have to say I didn't open them, so the the title could be just clickbaity. But yeah, I still think that like yeah, uh, indeed might focus less on Grand Tours, and I think I heard that quite a few times. And, well, he's shown in Lombardia that he can 
win one day races. Liège last year, he's got a few of them still on the table to win, including the likes of uh, World Championships or uh, or the likes of Tokyo uh, Olympics. So, yeah, those kind of races, I see him trying stuff like that. And I think that he's going to value that more than trying to go to the Giro again and trying for a podium again. In the end, looking at the rest of their squad, Vlazov was very promising at the start well, after COVID. Let's finish with their wins, though. Let's yeah. finish with their wins before we get into the squad analysis because I want to talk about one of the guys who won one of their Grand Tour stages. So the other, after Memor- Memorial Marco Pantani, we had two Tour de France stage wins. There was stage six with Lutschenko. Mm-hmm. Then got COVID, and that took him out for some races as well. Stage 17, Coldo de Lowe's. Remember Miguel Angel Lopez? But then Lopez... He was third, lost third position, and went down to sixth in the Tour de France on the last time trial. We'll talk about that in a second with the transfers. And then Yoni Zagire won that rainy stage, I think in stage six of the yes. Welsh or Spaniards. So not good GC results, to be honest, in my view, uh, for Astana. But I think they got really unlucky with Vlasov sickness, Lopez crashing in the Giro, Full saying having a couple of those punctures and what else? Lutschenko getting uh, getting COVID as well. So they, they did have a fair bit of bad luck that maybe cost them a few wins or World Tour stages or uh, a couple of GC positions uh, as well. That being said, I said this almost a year ago, Benji, or whenever, maybe it wasn't a year ago, whenever the COVID a revised, post-lockdown revised calendar came out, I said if you mm-hmm. want... If you want to get no, – no win is easy, but if you want to go on the easier program, the Italian program is the one. And I said – I think I said Full Sang should do the Italian program. Um, and that came true with Lombardia. It was a pretty weak field at Lombardia. Um, I, I know compared to other years, like no Balcomolema, maybe it was there, I don't know. But – that, he was there. <laughs> he was there. <laughs> Maybe I'm just imagining it. Uh, I guess Remco was there and, and others. But still, there was no Pagacha. None of the best punchers were there. Uh, in, so in best my- rider in the world was there, Vincenzo Newley. Come on. <laughs> yeah. But still, full saying went. He got the monument and... Um, Credit to them for putting him on that schedule. I think that was smart. But moving on to their transfers, Benji, people going out. Hernando Borges, uh, Zandos Bizgotov, Daniel Formenich. I, I got to admit, I don't know any of those guys. Uh, so <laughs> Lawrence De, de Vriese has gone to Alpes and Phoenix. I don't think that's too much of a loss for them, to be honest. And Miguel Angel Lopez is the big one. He's gone to Movistar, which is such a meme. It's such, it's so funny. Yeah. It's, what did he call them last year, Benji? Uh, idiots or something, I think. So Lopez, um, during that this is during stage. the Vuelta stage, yeah. I think Lopez called Movistar idiots, and now he's joined Movistar. And it's classic. It's just like another like second-tier GC contender joining Movistar, and it's going to be... Uh, I can't. I, I, maybe you'll get some stage wins. Out of that, but, <laughs> the <okay>. new trident. <laughs> do you do you think Astana going to miss Lopez? Uh, I think they will at some point in some races, but I don't feel like Lopez offers too much in the sense of GC in uh, in the likes of a Tour de France or a a Giro because his time trial is just way too weak for that. It's so bad. He, um, yeah, he lost so many, so much time in the last time trial of the Tour de France while it having a literal mountain at the end. So, yeah, I can't wrap my head around it. One of the weakest time trials of his career, despite having a good time trial in Argath last year. How does it stack up? Nobody knows. Either way, I think that that is his main weakness and that fits with Movistar as well because they always have GC leaders that can't TT, so... Where do you Perfect rank time? him as a GC, uh, as an all-around GC contender? Uh, he's not in my top ten, not near it. Hmm, I think he he might be um around ten to fifteen for me. I, I'd have to really think about it to to not put a proper list, but he probably won't be uh sub twenty, and he probably won't be in the top ten itself because there's just too many riders right now that 
are decent at GC, but better at time trial, which makes it in general just better than Lopez. And Lopez might be an amazing climber when it comes to uh, above 2K altitude, godlike mountain stage like Code La Loz, but Maybe he won't win GC with that yeah, yeah. if he loses like five minutes on a time trial. It's, it's just the main factor. And yeah, that's my take on Lopez. I think paying uh, not the top GC guys, uh, sort of, I, I presume he's getting paid pretty well. Maybe he's not at Movistar. Maybe I'm off. But if say he's on a million euro, I'd rather pay someone like Hirschi that amount of money than a sort of second tier GC contender. Yep. Although he did get that cold at a low stage win, I think you can still get stage wins elsewhere. We saw Sunweb do so on with smaller. Uh, or, or riders who aren't paid as much if you're just going for stage wins. And I don't think Lopez is going to be really vying to win a Grand Tour in, in 2021. So I don't think that's a bad move for uh, Stana to let him go. But the big man, let's talk about the people uh, coming in, Benji. You know these guys more than I do, Um Andre Piccolo from Colpac Balan, very talented young Italian rider, not so great results in 2020. Have you got any have you got a read on any of these young guys? Piccolo, Fedorov, Javier Romo, young Spanish guy, Batistella from NTT. I haven't seen too much of them except Piccolo. So Piccolo, just for the background for other people, comes from Colpac Balan, which is one of those uh very talented teams in uh in Conti level, I don't think they're pro Conti, um, and they bring forward developed riders, yeah, youth riders to uh, teams that are looking for them in World Tour, obviously. And um, Piccolo is one of those riders that did extremely well for the Italian team, um, but is also nas- second was second in the U twenty three National Championships ITT, but twenty third in U twenty three ITT, so he can time trial. But he's also not really too bad at climbing because, well, he was 29th in a Giro della Emilia in, a, well, 2020, which is, in my opinion, one of the uh, better one dot pro races out there. And 29th on those climbs in, in Bologna is definitely not a bad result. So I'd keep him in mind for a, a combination between climbing and time trial in the future. Kind of reminds me of the growth that Almeida went through as a youngster. So, yeah, perhaps he might be in Almeida's position in like two, three years, four years. That is where I see him going, at least. Javier Romo, Spanish guy, also good at time trialing. Well, decent at time trialing, at least. He won the uh, road race, U23 National Championship road race. I personally don't have a, a real view on what area he is. Uh, he is great at. I'm guessing it's not really a sprint or anything. I think it's actually something like climbing, but uh, I can't tell you for certain, so I won't pretend to. So Brero, he was good at time trial in the Giro last year at NTT, and I think we're going to see more of him. That's plain and simple. I think he got top 10s in time trials. The first ITT was 7th, then the uh, the one to Valdo Biadene was 11th. So strong rides from him. Rusensky. Not really sure. Fedorov is one of the Conti riders that um, was really strong at Vino Astana Motors in the sense that he's good at breakaways. And once he rides away, to get away the breakaway, it's hard to get him back. And he ends up winning solo quite a few times in uh, in Conti last year. And, well, he's uh, now joining Astana. I'm pretty hyped about that trend. So Battistella is the guy that is a U23 world champion still on paper. I, don't, I know you don't 100% agree with that knowing the Eichhoff thingy, but then we have uh, Steph on the bot and uh, Ben Perry left on the list, the bot, decent climber. Perry, I um, I don't know. I thought Generally the bot don't was know. a sprint. I thought the bot was a sprint. No. Yeah, he can climb. Oh, okay. Yeah, NTT, I really, yeah, NTT guy. I mean, they probably got them for pretty, pretty cheap, so I don't think too many of those guys are going to move the needle in 2021. I think their big guys are going to remain the same for 2021. Which is obviously full sang. There's a guy that won, he's won multiple monuments. Dauphiné looked like the best one one week racer in the world. I think he might have been the best rider in the world in 2019 by some rankings and metrics. Um, I, I didn't see that in 2020, but it was a weird calendar. 
if he could bring that back in 2021, I can't wait to see him in the one-week races again. I remember he was so dominant before the lockdown in 2020 in those Spanish tune-up races, just crazy strong. Uh, obviously, they've got Luis Leon Sanchez there. Uh, team leaders, probably Alex Ambaru, according to Benji. The Izaguirre brothers will be stage hunting. They're just always... Always there or thereabouts, picking up wins um, and picking up Grand Tour wins. Lushenko, he had he was so strong in 2020 in Tour de la Provence with Vlasov. Then he got that. It's just classic Lushenko season. Then just gets the Tour de France stage win, but then not much else. And yep. this is before he got COVID, by the way. And then obviously got COVID and that ruined his season as well, uh, if there was any other races left on his program. Hopefully he's fine and recovered well. Uh, I've seen he's posting on Instagram. He seen he seems all right, but who knows? Um, but hopefully he's all right and he comes back in 2021 um, attacking. I don't know. I think they may sh- should just send him stage hunting again because he's on his day. He's crazy strong, like Danny Martinez. He's similar rider. If, if he's in a break in a Grand Tour stage, medium mountain or proper mountain, you're you're worried. Uh, Felline yep. they'll send to the Italian Classics again, uh, but really it's. I think. Do you think they're going to be 100% committed to Vlasov going for GC in in one of the Grand Tours, Benji? Being and which one do you think? If so, which one do you think it would be? Vlasov is the kind of rider he, we had him on the podcast. So uh, if you haven't seen that interview, check it out. It should still be uh, on YouTube for us, and most likely also on the podcast platforms. But about his riding style, he seems to be better at the longer climbs, the ones with steady gradients, but is not necessarily weak at these steeper ones as well. He was second on Angliru, if we can't remember that. That's um, that's one hell of a thingy. But um, he was also not too terrible at Tireno before he went to the Giro. I think that he would fit better at something like the Giro, obviously compared to last year, preferably longer than two days. And if that's the case, then I believe he can do really well in Grand Tours. I had him as a um, dark horse last year to do really well at the Grand Tour. The illness that Giro kind of bottled that for him at the Vuelta, he ended up being extremely strong over three weeks. But his first day was uh, the weakest of them all, and he lost so much time on that first day. Was he? Okay. That, well, that I mean, he must have him. been, because I don't, he didn't have a mechanical or anything. I think he was still like a bit off yeah. or something. Um, and then I don't know, or maybe he just, who knows, but I, I remember he just had like a random couple of first days where he lost like yeah. 10 minutes or something. And then he was clawing it back the whole, and then for the rest of the welter, he was attacking the top GC guys, uh, going yeah. for stage wins. So the problem is the TT clearly, he looks like a Giro dell'Emilia Lombardia. He was class. He probably could have, he could have won Lombardia if they were riding for him. And the problem, yeah, he was he sure. was the ones attacking Bennett when they was just Bennett, Vlasov, and Full saying he could have won Lombardia if it worked out the other way. Um, he looks like a really really good hilly one day racer. And but when I asked him, I asked him that question. I said, "Is that what you think you are?" And maybe a stage hunter. He's like, "No, no, no. I'm a pure GC guy," and I think that's true. But yeah. I don't, I see him at Vuelta Burgos. I'd love to see him at that. Uh, I think he could win that stage race. Use that as a tune up, and as you said, I think he's actually better on those steeper climbs than he says he is. I know he said he's good at the longer ones, and he won Mont Blanc two challenge. So the problem is that I don't know. The tour has a lot of time trialing, but he seems to me Vlasov like on a stage at the Tour de France, like the Mont Blanc two double ascension day. He could actually go from far and really light up. I think he can do truly, truly world class climbing performances. I think up there with Pagacha on his day. So, like, there's not actually many guys. I think Roglic, Pagacha, Vlasov on their day can do truly monster watts per kilo. Uh, is there anyone else in that group you'd, you'd put Benji? Whew, I think that those are the names that we noticed from last year lopez on 2k plus stuff can do monster watts <laughs> definitely yeah. on call of laws but lopez he's can do six so. watts per kilo for like 50 minutes at 2k plus altitude yeah. um 
yeah, it's it's really hard to put other other names in that list at this very moment regarding actual mountain um, history that we saw so far. So yeah, he's one of the not so many at the moment, and I think we're gonna get to it in a bit. But he's one of my podium favorites that could podium the Giro if he goes there this year. So that's the the main guys at Astana that we think will, they'll be riding for next year. Aaron Baru. I think might be I don't know what his program will look like. He'll be trying to pick up stages. Harold Tejada, mark him down, Colombian. They signed, I think, to be a domestique for Lopez, and I seem to recall him having some sneaky good performances in that role uh, at the pointy end of some important races or against good competition, helping Lopez or some other riders. I think obviously Lopez isn't there anymore, but maybe Tejada might get an opportunity for himself. He's very young, but I think he'll also be put to work as a domest- climbing domestique for Flasov uh, or maybe full sang in the Dauphiné. But let's get now to their, who we'd send to various races, Benji, because it, it is, it's a very one, it, it's kind of a, so, say there's three dimensions to cycling, mm-hmm. cobble, class, cobble classics, stage hunting in stage races, or not Cobble Classic, sorry, one-day races in yeah, before and not including Lombardia. <laughs> Lombardia in its own sense is <laughs> a hilly classic, but, yeah, they're just – Cobble Classics is not good, uh, and GC, it's – they don't have too many guys either. So, like, stage hunting is their forte. But, anyway, Omloop, Kern Russell Kerner, Hent Vabelhem, Tour of Flanders, Paris-Roubaix, what team are you selecting – for those races, Benji from Astana. Yeah, it's hard, really. Honestly, it's I um, weak. I don't know what Adam Buru's history is on the cobbles, but he feels like <laughs> the rider type that would be fun to have on that. Nineteenth in Kuna Brussels Kuna. There we go. I, I said so. <laughs> the NF and envelope. So <laughs> small oh. detail, but uh, <laughs> I had to go to Adam Buru first. You know it. <laughs> um. Honestly, their team is extremely weak on the cobble sections, and it's extremely hard to even remotely have a, a full team on that area. I think that Lutsenko might be their strongest rider on the on the cobbles, but would you send him there knowing that he will do really well at the Hill Classics afterwards? I would perhaps not really think of doing that. Perhaps one of them, but not too many at least. So, Sobrero and Piccolo maybe? Like the TT guys? Ah... Uh, I, I wouldn't put Piccolo up there. He doesn't seem like uh, a cobble build guy. Sobrero, perhaps, but I don't know what his history is on cobbles. Batistella? Uh, it doesn't seem overly likely. Batistella might be more of an option. Yeah. But just in general, these are riders that, if they go to the likes of a cobble race, they're going to be there to be in the initial breakaway or will be there for a top 30. They are not likely to get a top 10 result or top 5 result in any of the cobble races and therefore my main question here is yeah what's the point there's like it's not like they're gonna win a cobble race if Lutsenko is not there so and, and this is a really uh, interesting point about Alpes and Phoenix Alpes and Phoenix because they have not been a world tour team have been able to pick and choose the races they sending riders to races costs money it, you don't just it, it it's not free. You don't just turn up at the race. It's another line item, sending riders to races and all the costs associated with that. And I, I sort of talk a little bit about that with Yana Seal at the end of, at the uh, end of this podcast. But if if Astana were a pro Conti team, Benji, you just wouldn't really bother with those races, would you? Except for maybe yep. sending some of the younger guys to test the waters. Where and Alpes and Phoenix have been able to do the same. They just pick and choose the races they want to do. And they get invited to half of them because they got Vanderpol. So that's the one drawback of being a world tour team is that you have to attend all the races and field a team. And they are going to have to do that. And I'm not sure they're going to get too many results there. Regarding who they're going to pick, yeah, I don't, I don't really know. Uh, Hugo Ulm. He, um, he's the yeah. kind of rider that I think will be in the breakaway in one of the Cobble races. Boaro, Fellini, maybe. Nah. Yeah, nah. Anyway, let's get to Fellini what has about. history, but yeah. The Ardennes is where they're really going to be dangerous. Uh, I think, obviously, full saying leader with Vlasov as a second option, sort of co-leader. 
Luis Leon Sanchez, Izaguirre brothers, Lutsenko, Fellini, Kudus is very strong, Omar Freil, Freile, Tahada. I think Tahada we might see at Liege, based on Liege as well. Um, any other names you that stand out for you that you'd put in their Liege Amstel team? Those are the big names, and Full Sang should be on paper leader. That is uh, my simple explanation here. I think that overall they've got a really strong squad to send through these races. If you start off with Strade as the first Hill Classic, I'm not sure we fit that under Hill Classic of Car or Gobble Classic. It's kind of in between. But that's a place where Lutsenko would be really useful as well, next yep. to Full Sang. Those Full would be my two leaders favorite, there. In my view. Yep, indeed. And if we go to likes of Liege, West only Asian Surge, then Full Sang is easily a, a top three favorite and potential favorite for the victory if he if he is in a decent form. And overall, the team is really complete in that. Omar Freyla, really good at those late season yeah. classics. So the likes of a San Sebastian or a, a Lombarda, he has history at. But I think that Lombarda was ridden very differently in uh, in 2020. So not sure how he's going to get ridden in 2021. And who it will offer opportunities for. Yeah, outside of those two riders, they're mainly going to be there in support of their leaders. We know that Luis Leon Sanchez is not too terrible at Hills as well. He's uh, getting a bit older though, 37. So San I Sebastian think he's slowly but surely. He will, attack in San Seb- he will attack in San Sebastian like 35 yeah. days out. <laughs> oh, he <man>. has to. <laughs> I think one... Okay, so that, that's pretty pretty straightforward in my view. Milano San Remo is Aramburu, right? Not even memeing. He came seventh in 2020. Yep. It, he has to be their guy, right? Yes. Aramburu is the kind of rider that can get over steep, steep hills, kind of get over hills. As long as they're not like five kilometers and a proper climb, he should be able to be in the elite group at the end of that climb. And with the likes of the Poggio and the Cipressa, he should be able to get over that. His problem is that he doesn't have the uh, quality to follow an attack of Alaphilippe. Because he's not that good of a puncher compared to an Alaphilippe, for example, he's 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 lower in that. Quite I mean, simple. That's not, that's not like a, not a, not a criticism. Yeah, not, indeed, not his fault. <laughs> not many people <laughs> Alaphilippe. But the problem is, can he can he beat the other guys? And say the second group catches Alaphilippe and Wout van Aert next year, you know, or whoever whoever's gone clear, because someone's going to attack and get a, a small gap. But say they get caught by the uh, quote unquote sprinters group who aren't really pure sprinters anymore. Uh, is Aaron Baru going to have the quality to beat those guys in a bunch sprint, the likes of Matthews and uh, and Peter Sagan? That, that's the question. No. Putting him at Milano San Remo is not out of the question. It's it's possible. For It's uh, possible, unlike- but he'd need an exceptional day to be able to beat the riders in that second group, knowing that the likes of a Sagan, the likes of a Van Aert, uh, even Ala Philippe can sprint really well. He he's slightly under that for me. And what sorry? Kwiatkowski. Yep. Ah. I'm not sure about Kwiat. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. Fair enough. But yeah, that's the point. Is that a lot lot would have to go right for them to win for Armbrew to win Milano San Remo. But on to okay, Lombardia again, like the Arden squad, very, very straightforward. Full Sang Vlasov and uh, a host of supporting riders. Uh, Kudus, Freyle, take your pick. Going to the Grand Tours now, Benji, we don't know the Giro parkour exactly. We don't know the Vuelta parkour. We know the Tour de France route. I've, we've already studied it in detail and done the Tour de France preview. It's like two hours. Check it out uh, on the podcast. But I think the Giro route's being released soon, but we've got to deal with it, the information or the vacuum that we have now. Who are you sending to the Giro for Astana? Noting that apparently Landa, Evenepoel, Buchmann are going to the Giro. Definitely Bernal, I think, probably. Who are you sending? Personally, I'd send Vlasov because the climbs in the Giro fit him really well. In the Tour de France, the climb... Oh, in the Tour de France, the climb really fits them as well. But there's just not enough when it comes to real hard mountain stages in that Tour de France parkour and I'm hoping that in the Giro that is the case. The problem here is he wrote the Giro in the Vuelta last year or at least three days of the Giro and the full Vuelta. I would be thinking that he might get his chance at his first Tour de France this year and that is because well Fulsang 
as we both have noticed, has mentioned that he is not likely to go for the likes of a GC. And I don't see a team with the stature of Astana skipping out on GC in the Tour de France. Because if you don't send Vlasov to the Tour de France, who else do you have as potential GC leader? So, so you think he's going to the? You would send him to the tour, or that they will send him to the? Tour? I think they will send him to the tour, but I hope he goes to the Giro. Or that's what I've got. Sporting results? Would you send him tour or Giro? What? Sorry. Like purely uh, setting aside yeah. the commercials of the Tour de France, would you send to get the best result possible? Would you send Vlasov to the tour or the Giro? I would send him to the Giro. I just feel like those climbs would fit him more. Those longer. Steady climbs and also the general feel of the Giro fits him better with the competition that is there. Knowing that the likes of Pogachar and Roglic will go to the Tour de France, he will be in the uh, the Giro pool of riders where time trial is not their strongest capability, and they're going to be on a similar level for those time trials in the Giro because there's going to be a lot of cl- TT kilometers in the Giro as well. On paper, I think two or three time trials are rumored at the moment, roughly sixty kilometers in total. That is likely going to happen. Giro is not likely to just smash out the TTs and just put one instead. It's not really what they do. So if we expect a normal Giro Paco with two or three time trials, with 40 to 60 time trial kilometers, then he's going to need that time trial. But if all the riders that do GC that can TT go to the likes of the Tour de France, then it's going to be on paper easier to go to the Giro than the Tour de France for Vlasov. See, they got a problem, Astana, with the Tour de France backing up to the Olympics because Vlasov, he yep. could win that. Uh, well, can he ride the Olympics? I, I don't know if he can because he's Russian and they. Um, okay, I'm not sure if he can ride the Olympics. So I think I think he's definitely going to the Tour de France. Uh, they he's their best GC rider. In, in a three-week race, he's their best climber, one of the best climbers in the world. I think you have to send him to the tour because it's not just about winning. You, you know, like fifth, <laughs> fifth at the Tour de France is massive and Vlasov can still get fifth at the Tour de France. Yep. He can still be in the select GC group every single day on the climbs. Okay, maybe he gets – we know what happens at the Tour de France with Roglic and Pogaccia for most of the stages. They're all riding together in a group of six or seven and then there's a sprint to the line at the end and maybe he gets gapped by three to four seconds. Okay, that's three seconds you've not been in the camera but you've had the camera on you for the whole climb. Like that's what the sponsors want and Vlasov's capable of doing that. He's capable of attacking. He will, you know, he, he saw on the Vuelta, he'll attack. Even when he's been dropped, he'd come back and attack when they slowed down. So I think he's going to the, the, uh, the Tour de France. I also think... The Giro is hard for them because I think just setting up a program, yeah, the program with the Ardennes where they'll be targeting those races plus doing the Giro is hard. So I think Fulsang as well, probably send him to the Dauphiné and and the Tour de France. And I don't know what they'll do with Fulsang, maybe go for stages, maybe help Vlasov. I'm I'm not sure Um, because if he's not riding for GC in Grand Tours, then... I presume he's going to be stage hunting. Um, Rita Giro, I think they'll send a stage hunting squad. Maybe they'll let Tejada go and maybe they back to Harold Tejada and say, hey, see what you can do. And if he loses 20 minutes, has a mistake or whatever, he can go for stages. He's he's capable of winning a Giro at Italia stage, I think, Harold, Harold Tejada uh, in a breakaway. So I think that's going to be how they ride the Giro. Tour de France, I've already said, and then the Vuelta, I don't know. <laughs> no, who knows? I think the Izaguirre brothers pencil in a stage win for them at the Vuelta already. That's happening. And maybe they send one of full sang of Lasov uh, as well. And Oscar Rodriguez, Spaniard, he'll go the, the Vuelta. I'd say, what, what do you think Lutsenko's program is going to be, Benji? He's Kazakh. I think he's a, a massive shout for a medal at Tokyo uh, as well. So That's a good point. Do yeah. you think oh, Tokyo is definitely in the card? And you remember uh, regarding Astana, his, yeah. Astana, Astana's Kaz, Kazakh team, st- the Kazakhstan, like Astana, it's like state sponsored team. It's not like with other teams where it's uh, 
like what I'm trying to say is sorry. What I'm trying to say is if Lutsenko wins a medal at the Olympics, it's Astana are happier with that than maybe yeah. another team who are like, oh, you did nothing for us all season and then you won a medal for your country. It's like, no, no, no. Astana want their Kazakh riders. Getting a medal at the Olympics is massive for them. We have Savino won two medals at the Olympics. So, yeah, do you, what, what program do you think Lutsenko will do, Benji? I think he'll start with the likes of a UAE or something in, uh, in February, then move into Very Strade good. Bianche. Could ride a few cobble races. I'm not sure he will. Um, Hill Classics will be in the cards most likely. And once that is over, one of the Grand Tours. I um, Well, if you send Vlasov to the Tour and they actually do that, then I'd send Lutsenko to the Giro, knowing that there's a, a good part left before the Olympics so that he can get ready for that in time as well, because we still don't know whether the Tour de France and the Olympics can be... Uh, can be both ridden. I think they're going to be able to ride them both eventually. But regarding quarantine restrictions, having to uh, be in quarantine in in, J- in Japan for two weeks before the Olympics might give might give all the TDF riders trouble to get there in time. But that aside, I um I think that Olympics should indeed be one of the higher things on his cards. I didn't think about it until you said it, but he is so ideal for this race. Like quite yep. generally. And full sang, I um, yep, full sang as well. But maybe yeah. maybe the climb's a bit long. It, it does suit Lutsenko better. You're right. Like on that longer climb around Fuji is is really Lutsenko territory, right? And Micah. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 honestly quite a good ride for him, and I believe he's got chances there, like you say. And then I, after that, he could ride it, but. I, I'd have to look that up. I don't know. Maybe maybe someone informed can comment down below on the YouTube video or let us know on Twitter what whether Vlasov can ride or Sivakov even because Sivakov's not – he's still Russian uh, nationality. So I don't – I presume Vlasov and Sivakov can't do the, the Tour de France. Uh, the, yeah, uh, I heard something about, um, about Sivakov being able to do so under a different flag, but I don't know the details of that. So – yeah. I guess uh, someone would need to school us on that in the comment section indeed. Anyway, that's what we think uh, are the main or who, who Astana will send to the various races this season in 2021. I think, as Benji said, focus will definitely be Strade plus Ardennes, one-week race. It's all about full sank. I mean, and this is getting into uh, whether and Vlasov. Be a, and Vlasov, sorry, whether their season will be a success or not. It really hinges on those two riders. Yes, I think Lutsenko could pick up some some big highlight wins, a Grand Tour win here or there. Uh, I but I don't see many other massive wins coming from anyone but Fulsang and Vlasov. So they need to be firing for them to have a good season. What do you think would constitute a good season for them, Benji? Fifteen wins last year. Do you think he won a monument each of the last yeah, two years? Monument, um, fifteen wins, monument, three uh, Grand Tour stage wins. I would be saying a um, a top five of the Grand Tour would be making it good with the likes of Vlasov in their team. Yeah, I think they would need good results at the um, Hill Classics. Indeed, whether they would need to win a monument for it to be a good season. With the riders that they have on their team, I would say yes, knowing that Fulsang's on their team. He would not be happy with the season if he can't get a big win result throughout the season. And next to that, yeah, the likes of Boss Country or stuff like that with the Ezekiere brothers, good results there, just overall in the season, yeah. consistently decent yeah, results yeah. and a few Grand Tour stage wins. That's what I would need to see for the um, for the team to be... Uh, while well, having acceptable results, the likes of a Giro win, a stage win at least, uh, a Velta stage win here and there, or a Tour de France stage win here and there. If they can get a stage win in all three Grand Tours, then I would say their season uh, is well is well done for sure. But they've uh, they've had pretty decent seasons the last two years, but it's I, mainly I, fed by them. I think I they're really, I think they're a well run team like management like so the whole all the staff i think get pretty good results out of the riders they have and i think they're going to win 25 races over 25 races 
uh, next or this year. And I think there's going to be some big results in there too. I think Full Sang was, is going to be should be back, and I don't think they'll miss Lopez too much. Maybe I'll eat my words, but I think I think Vlasov. I think mean well maybe I won't speak for you, Benji, but I think Vlasov is is legit. Uh, I think Vlasov is a better GC rider than Lopez will be. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he's he's got that just pure, just pure climbing talent, which we saw on Mon Wall too when he dropped Richie Port, who was also flying this this season. But that's and what think. something. Oh, yeah, sorry. And something we haven't spoken about is the fact that the guy can actually DC uh, TT decently. Unlike Lopez, he was 24th at the time trial in the Grand Tour in 2020 in La Vuelta. And that was on a decent level. That's two minutes behind Roglic, obviously, but it's not five minutes behind I, I, Roglic. So. I, think it, I think the TT is a real problem, personally. Yeah. I think. And I know he's working on it. I see he's put on so. I mean, I guess a lot of people put on social media that they're on the TT bike. But <laughs> I presume that's been a big focus in the off season. Is the TT that seems to be compared to the other attributes, uh, the weakness. He's just got a be. He's got a big frame, right? He's a tall guy. He's yeah. over six foot, I think. Uh, it, it must be harder for him to get into quite an aerodynamic position, given how skinny he is. Uh, that size, maybe, but I guess all sizes make it work. So, but that's definitely something he, he needs to improve. I think if he if you want to contest for the podium in any Grand Tour, yep. you need to really pick up your TT. Even Carapaz, we saw in the Vuelta, he did a better TT than we than I expected, and you have to be doing that to to stay in contention. Same with Carthy. You know, look at Carthy. It's good TT in the Vuelta, and that's why he was up there too. But that's our preview for the Astana team, what we think will happen with them in 2021. Now is our interview with Yana Seal, their managing director, talking about uh, some of the changes in the team, her role in the team, and uh, why Premier Tech came on board. So make sure you give the – if you're watching this on YouTube, give it a like down below or on Twitter, and, uh, yeah, maybe just reach out and let us know whether you liked us integrating the interview like this. Because it yeah, makes it worth it for us to go out, reach out to people for interviews, and it's always a big time commitment from them. And so, thanks for Yana being generous with her time. Yana, maybe explain to people who sort of follow cycling generally but don't think about the business part of it why will, will Premier Tech, a Canadian company, and sort of the infrastructure, or sorry, in the industrials manufacturing space, why are they coming into sort of title sponsorship? What's the title sponsor wanting to get out of it? Premier Tech, if you, uh, Premier Tech is already, it's not the first year that they are on board with us. Uh, Premier, Premier Tech joined uh, the team, um, um, I think three years ago already, yeah. they were a sponsor um, with the team. And um, okay, of course, we have a lot of sponsors, I think maybe more than 40 sponsors. Most of them are uh, manufacturers are on the cycle market, but Premier Tech is a company, uh, it's a completely different market. Yeah. And first of all, I think the CEO, uh, Jean Belanger, um, he's in love with cycling. And it's a quite common phenomenon in cycling that the people yeah. are coming on board. Um, first of all, it's a company which would like to sell the product on the cycling market or for the cyclists who love cycling, but a quite common phenomenon, people who are just in love with cycling or with the general image of the team. At the moment, uh, because it was not easy for Astana, pro team at that time, 15 years sponsored by Kazakh government, um, to take this step and to take a decision that we will ask somebody coming on board. For the government in Kazakhstan, um, we we didn't decide it. They didn't decide it very quick because 15 yeah. years it was a stand-up rule team. Um, but you see, Mark is changing um, very quick at the moment. Um, also, with the COVID situation, yeah. it's not easy. And I think during these 15 years. Um, Astana uh, built a great brand and a great image. So after 15 years, we were able, or the team uh, was able to say, I think now we are ready to take somebody on board. We can share also our experience and our image. I think you've mentioned in a previous article, maybe on Vila Flitz, that Premier Tech also have a vision for the team and, and changing the team. Is that, I noticed 
Astana put up on your YouTube channel, um, uh, Ride for Glory video. And that's like, oh, go and check it out. It's gone viral. Well, it's got like over 200,000 views, like getting really good traction. Is that something that Premier Tech wanted more, like more uh, exposure on social digital media? Is that just an initiative from you? Is that from Sven? I know Sven Yonker reasonably well. Like, where did that come from? Wanting to do stuff on like proper pieces on social media. To be honest, all our ideas are coming from the team together. So we sit together. It's not like from one person or from Premier Tech. Uh, we have a great marketing department. Uh, and um, all our ideas, we just sit together and we think how we want to see it. We discuss with each other. And in discussion, we get on, on a final decision how we want to see it. And we show to the people, we show to, okay, first it's uh, um, always marketing department, but then we share with the riders, do you feel okay or do you feel good with it? And then after, actually we do it common all together. It, the, for us, it's very important that the team feels the same what we show. It's not just a marketing strategy. We show what we feel to the community. Yeah, and that's I agree with wanting to get rider buy-in for things like that's really important because if, if the riders don't want a camera in their face during the time, it's just not going to be good content. So, yeah, having rider buy-in on it really makes a, a massive difference. The, your background is not like you're not like a lifelong um sort of manager in cycling kind of like myself i loved a lot of other sports before cycling i was a lawyer beforehand what in cycling when you so sort of first started working seriously in cycling or um advising astana what were the things that stood out to you as just really strange and unique to cycling or one thing that was unique to cycling that wouldn't happen in any other industry. I mean, what for me, the weirdest thing is how in the Tour de France, the last mm-hmm. stage is not a competitive stage. I think that's, I think that's so strange that it's a prof- like a procession and that in any other sport, like in the NBA finals or the Super Bowl, they wouldn't just take the last half of the fourth quarter to pat each other on the back. Um, yeah. But if you say that to a, a cycling person, they say that's sacrilege. You have to. This is the way we do it. But what, in your in your opinion, are some of those things that could change? Uh, but first of all, when I came, um, everything was new for me. So I had to learn uh, for, for for the sportive part to understand. It was everything was new. So I spent it almost the whole year 2019, and I was asking, asking, asking questions all the time. Why you do this? Why you do that? Why you decide like this? Because for me, as a manager, to decide the global strategy, I need to understand their needs and to understand where they want to go and why they take this decision. Because um, uh, the general rule in management, you want to take you want people to perform better, the staff, for example. You have to take the people out of their comfort zone. And it's not so easy because the people going off their comfort zone, they see around, they look around, they see some other things, and then they start performing and you show the way and they start performing different. It does not mean that the people did or do something bad or wrong, no. But you can always, cycling is a very classical sport and you have a lot of great um, people, uh, sport directors, uh, masseurs, um, um, uh, mechanics, but they have a vision and classical vision in cycling is very difficult to change. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, it's very difficult to try to explain to somebody who is already 30, 35 years in cycling me as a woman, 36 years old, coming not from cycling, start to explain, you know, I want to try to do a bit different. It's uh, first of all, I had to understand how they think their needs and what they do. And it was not easy. Yeah. Was- so w- what are a couple of those things that you you wanted to change? Is it stuff with management of the team? Is it... Um, sort of different sponsors like what what are a couple of the things that you thought needed to change perhaps at Astana or you're looking to change in 2021 
Um, I think the most important thing for me was, okay, the general management, um, it was good. And we had just to maybe optimize some processes. But the, for me, the most important thing was the uh, good marketing department. Because, okay, yeah. you have the sports team. And this is, this is the key for success because each sponsor which is coming on board, they want to have the best team. We have a lot of cycling teams, but the most competitive one on the market will get the best sponsor. This is clear. This is very simple rule because um, um, how longer you are um, in the broadcasting, you have more visibility. So the sponsor first, they choosing the best team. But second of all, so to have a good sportive team, you need to, to have a department which is busy athletes and the sport directors. And behind this, you have a marketing team which will be busy with the activation for a sponsor because the sponsors, um, they don't want to pay any more just for the place on the jersey. It's, it's long done. They don't yep. pay for it. But they want the total activation on the market uh, to decide their marketing strategy um, uh, how we gonna uh, do? How we gonna speak, or which message we're gonna send to the customers? It's it's really huge work work behind with the marketing department. And for me, the two things were very important uh, to leave the sport depart department doing their job properly to get the best results. And they are asking for the best bikes, for the best food, for the best masseurs. It's it's really a huge cost. And then after it, so we have the marketing department, which is busy with a global strategy for the team, deciding, okay, which image, how we see, how we want that the people see us, um, and also working with the sponsors to sit together, thinking together with them. And very important thing for me, that the people um, in our team, our athletes, they believe in the products of our sponsors, not just showing, but they really believe that they have the best bike, the best food, and the best clothes or other sponsor. I cannot tell, say yeah. them all now, but it, this is the very important thing. The, on this way, you will get the best results, the best return on investment. It's in my opinion. Well, yeah, like at its core, the way cycling is structured, your team... Uh, are not going to make like how much money are you going to make from prize money as a total percentage of like sponsor um as your revenue for the year it's a very small percentage is the actual prize money from races you don't teams don't get uh revenue sharing from broadcast deals like in the nba or in other sports so really the only revenue is from sponsors and for so many years and still a lot of other teams it sounds like you're changing it but the teams are there to market or they they receive money for marketing the sponsors products and to have three di director sportives five masseurs etc whole all everyone has all the staff in the sporting side but yet they're getting paid from the sponsors and they maybe have one marketing person or they don't give money to the marketing team or they have like one press officer when as you're saying, you need a good marketing team for the active to do the proper activation. So I think, yeah, social media and digital media, and obviously that's something I'm really into with the podcast and the YouTube channel, is a way to get guaranteed. Like you can, maybe the riders crash first stage. Your GC rider crashes on the first stage, and you like Miguel Angel Lopez in the in the uh, Giro of Vuelta last year, and that really sucks and it's bad luck. But then if you have the film crew like you did for your documentary on YouTube, it's guaranteed. It's scheduled. It's guaranteed exposure. You can control the message. Um, so I'm not saying one or the other is better, but I think in 2020, 2021, you have to have both. For me, what is my role? It's to decide and to split the budget because, okay, cycling teams, as you know, uh, for 80 or 90 percent, we are living from the sponsorship revenues. Yeah. And if you compare us with the other sports, it's like football, it's 10 or 15 percent. So we are in totally different situation. So it's very important to manage your sponsors well. And that the sponsor, okay, it, it, it's great if you have one, one, one or two big sponsors, but the small sponsors, uh, also, all sponsors are important. So, because because our our our, our structure is like this, we we have no choice. 
And during the last two years, I saw, I analyzed the market when I came, um, uh, when I came in cycling, and I saw that there were. Uh, when the big teams are coming, they change the market a little bit because we see that um, everything start better equipment. They are also asking now for the race organizers to be to to follow the the the, the rules for organization. And it's not so easy for small races to survive because in the past, as we know in the history of cycling, a lot of volunteers were working during the races. They were also the fans. But now for this kind of races, it's almost no, not possible to survive because they cannot meet the rules which are prescribed by UCI. So they need to be very professional. What we saw, for example, um, okay, we, we see it in, in each race of so the small races also for continental team, plus the COVID situation, which we had this year, it was very difficult to organize. So it, this is the risk which I see in cycling in the, in the upcoming years. Um, so we need to spend more to have a good equipment to be, to be protected also for our riders. Um, and also you have to think about getting the, the budget on time for the team. What's one thing you'd like to see changed in cycling in, say, in 2025? You'd like to see in, in 2025 something different in cycling. Is it a full three-week uh, women's Tour de France? Is it revenue sharing? Is it what, What's something you'd like to see uh, in four years from now? Yeah, it's a very, very good question. And it's tricky to give an answer, I think. Uh, it's tricky to give an answer. Definitely, I want to see um, a woman cycling uh, because um, uh, it's hard for them to survive for the for the women teams. And we supported also last year Astana women team. And I see it's not it's really not easy for the girls uh, to do it. But I think uh, in men's cycling we're already very high, but the women cycling has has an opportunity to grow a great yeah. opportunity to grow um so um this this is the thing that it can be improved definitely and uh, some other things um yes more protection um and possible possible that um we can get some extras uh, from the race organizers because it's okay we can we can keep it still some years to survive like this from the sponsor to have a good marketing department behind the team um, uh, but it's it's not so easy it's not so easy so if it will be possible to change um, to have at least a little bit more uh, I think for the cycling teams um, and also to improve in the uh, in kids because yeah. cycling is something uh, this is a very special sport you see the people um, there are a lot of people like i'm from belgium i live in belgium uh, the kids are born with their bicycle there so they they start to i think from 2 3 years old they go on the bike so if we can um, uh, in, improve maybe to support the the young generation uh, that the people going to change from the car to the bikes um, and this we can do with the cycling. And I think UCI are uh, doing a lot of things already at the moment to improve that fact. Um, so maybe we can uh, take the young generation with us to change the mentality a little bit. Yeah, and that, I think that's one of the problems I've, I've found with pro cycling is all there's been so much uptake, even up during COVID, with people buying bicycles. You can't go and buy a bicycle, they've all run out. But then how do you get those people to be interested in professional, watching professional cycling? Uh, but the one thing I want to change is the jerseys during the Grand Tours. I think the King of the Mountains jersey at the Tour de France, maybe people are going to hate on me for this, it makes no sense. Explain to someone who doesn't watch cycling that the person who wins the best climber's jersey is usually not the best climber in the race. And they did some... They got in breakaways. It should be timed. Who did the quickest times on a selection of climbs during the race? So that's food for thought. People can comment down below saying that I'm crazy for that or not. But thanks, Yana, very much for coming on. Hope you ha guys are starting to have a fantastic season uh, and we'll see you, I'm sure. We'll see Astana on the top step in a fair few races this year. Best of luck. Thank you. Bye.
Hope you enjoyed that interview from Jana Seal, Managing Director at Astana Premier Tech. Thanks for listening to the podcast as always. Cheers from Benji and I, and we'll see you with the next preview in the next couple of days. Ciao.